When you look at this map, what jumps out at you? Is it power? Is it shape? Is it elevation? Do you think about quality of vision? You know, what do you immediately see when you look at a topography? Well, one of the ways that we can observe topography is based on its power. The axial interpretation is one of those mathematical calculations or formulas that goes into converting the data that the instrument grabs to something that displays shape and power and so on and so forth. Here what we see is how the eye is distinguished based on power. Now when you think about power, you might say, well, should this patient see well? Should we have good quality of vision? Now although it's such a high corneal astigmatism of four and a half diopters, it's otherwise a very regular eye shape. Axial is one of the ways that you can interpret the eye shape relative to power or vision. The tangential map is another interpretation that converts the data slightly differently, but the tangential map is best to understand the shape of the eye. Where does it curve? Where does it curve most radically? Where is it the least interesting? Where does it have the least curvature change? So the tangential map is very sensitive to any kind of instance of change in power. One of those things that I think we all get wrong when we're relatively new to topography, and I know I was very guilty of this. I really struggled to try to figure out what is all this data the instrument has given you. So the question is, what is the highest point on this cornea? When you look at these two interpretations of the same eye, one axial, one tangential, what is the highest point on the cornea? Kind of tricky. I'm sure you would say, well, got to be the red on the axial map, right? That's the steepest portion. And you would be right. That is the steepest portion of the eye. But is it the highest point? Similarly, on the tangential, you notice the hottest contour is toward the top. That's the steepest portion. But is it the highest portion? Well, neither of these two topographies tell us about elevation. They don't tell us which is the high and which is the low. And that's the elevation map. Is it interprets based on a spherical surface where the eye is the most elevated? what is red to you? Red is, in the elevation map at least, it's the highest point. So if you were to drop a contact lens on this patient, it is going to hit hardest, it is going to hit first on that red, on the highest point on the eye. Whereas the blue is where the eye is depressing, where it's losing elevation, it's dropping in height. In relative to a rigid contact lens, red is where you'll have your bearing and blue will be where you have your pooling. Very simple and straightforward. In a case that's as easy as this, it's probably not necessary to use an elevation map because you would know the a contact lens is going to bear across the flattest meridian. It's going to lift across the steepest meridian. But when we start dealing with the irregular cornea, understanding the elevation map becomes really, really important. So when we look at this eye, what is the highest point on this cornea? We would want to shift over to that elevation map to understand where would our landing, where would our lift. Now, to get your perspective, to understand relative to where do they come up with these colors with this elevation map, it's using what's called a best fit sphere. And that's the closest radius that will generally match the non-spherical nature of the eye. As you know, there's really no cornea you have ever seen in your practice that's truly spherical. It might have a spherical K reading, but it's always slightly asymmetric in some way, shape, or form. And certainly it's not spherical from the center to the periphery. So the best fit sphere sphere is kind of the closest we can come up with as a radius to match the eye. So how do you get a sense of that? Well, if we take the flat meridian, that horizontal, that white line where I have it right now, and we draw a dotted green line across the graph at the bottom, that is the sphere. The green line is the perfect spherical surface. And where you see the red on either side at either end of the graph, that's at three and nine o'clock, the tissue is elevated. It's high in elevation. So it's telling you that a contact lens will bear heavily on that point. Uh, ortho K lens, as an example, it's going to touch down at three and nine o'clock. And this is generally good because we want the landing laterally. We want our landing at three and nine to keep the lens laterally stable. So we're kind of happy about this. Now let's go to the steep axis, or in this case, the vertical meridian. Let's look at that white axis line that's running from around axis 105 degrees. And then let's draw that green 
dotted line across the graph. That's the perfect spherical surface. Now you see on either ends of the graph that the blue is fallen below that green line, way below, well beyond 50 microns. So what it's telling you is the elevation of the eye is really dropping at 12 and 6 o'clock. That therefore would mean that we would have a rigid lens with tons of pooling at 12 and 6. If that's still kind of hard to get your head around, and it took me an awful long time to figure out the elevation map, uh, my colleague Pat Caroline put together this slide to kind of help me along. And if you look at the flat meridian slide in the middle, what you see is your OCT image of the horizontal axis, the flat meridian. That yellow line is your perfect spherical surface. It's aligning right in the center, but you'll notice the yellow line drops below the tissue at the far ends, and that's where the elevation of the eye is high. Conversely, if you look at the vertical or steep meridian, you'll notice that the yellow spherical surface is above the tissue. It's on the left side of our OCT. And that's saying that the cornea is dropping away from the sphere. It's losing elevation. It might take a little while for you to kind of get your perspective on this elevation map. But once you figure it out, you understand the alignment and the lift of every rigid contact lens you're about to fit before you even drop it on the cornea. As Stephanie said, it's really a valuable analysis prior to any specialty lens fitting. Placido is one of those reflective-based systems. It's very contact lens oriented. So especially related to North American optometry, that definitely is a good fit. The downside of a Placido topographer is it reflects off the eye surface. And if the eye surface isn't a perfect mirror, if you have scarring, if you have severe tear film breakup, then it's going to be harder for the instrument to interpret what's underneath because the reflection-based system looks at the fluid surface, not the underlying cornea. It understands the underlying cornea based on the shape of the overlying fluid. Now, profilometry is a more recent addition, and what a cool technology this is for those of you who do scleral lenses, because it is a corneal scleral topographer. It's able to image the sclera. The upside, of course, is that it's so powerful in your scleral contact lens fitting. The downside is that it's a little more challenging to image because you do need to fluoresce the eye, and it needs to reflect off that kind of non- reflective white surface, the sclera, with something with dye. You should spend the time with your staff on topography capture, learning how to take really good captures. You know, imagine if you're an orthokeratologist and we just snap a really quick photo. We don't really spend a lot of time to do an ideal job and patient walks and we now order the lens, but we started with a bad topography. Now we're going to custom order the lens. We're going to have another visit. Maybe that lens works. If it doesn't work, now now we're guaranteed two extra visits because we didn't spend the time on the topography. The Scheinflug systems, they're much more surgically oriented because they give us so much more information. They can tell us about the anterior surface like the other two types of technologies we discussed, but they can also measure thickness and the posterior fluid thickness, sorry, the posterior corneal thickness. So really valuable in for those considerations. So if you're more surgically oriented, then this is definitely the instrument for you. It tends not to be as contact lens oriented, although it's really, they've really been up in their game lately to try to help us use this tool for more things. Hopefully you'll get the sense that there are a lot of great options when it comes to topography, but each one favors a certain direction or few directions. So you got to figure out what do I want most out of the instrument and then go for the technology that provides that. Ocular coherence tomography in its present form, it's not so much a topographer, but it definitely could be used as one. This is kind of the new kid on the block that will follow and see how it evolves because it has the potential to be highly accurate in providing us, you know, micron accuracy accurate lens scatter. So just a few things of when to use your topographer. These are just tips that I wanted to say for people that they may be thinking, I don't know when I would use a topographer besides maybe some of the cases that Randy said. What are some other things of when I can even use it and how can I really increase increase my return on investment? Because that's really important. These machines, they cost a lot of money. And so we want to make sure that we are maximizing the use. So in a traditional contact lens practice or traditional 
traditional optometry setting. You can do it on some or all of your soft contact lens patients. In industry average, 30% of all comprehensive exams that you do are patients that wear contact lenses. So if you imagine you can do that on 30% of the patients that are coming in, it's really good to track their corneal shape over time. It's a great tool to evaluate and identify those suspicious corneas very early on. Also, I always would suggest using a topographer on kids or adults that have any sort of suspicious Ks that you find on the auto refractor. Same thing with, with suspicious refraction. Kids and adults that have any sort of suspicious refraction would also warrant a topography. Patients that have increasing sill or they have a suspicious axis. Or maybe you're of a patient and their vision is just not achievable to 2020 with a manifest refraction. These are reasons why you would warrant doing a topography. Patients that uh, are kids and they have a parent that has a known corneal diagnosis. So let's say you have a parent that has keratoconus, I would highly recommend doing a topography on, on any of their children. Any patients that are keratoconus suspects for whatever reason would warrant a topographer. I always call it kind of like the gut check or when something just doesn't add up with your clinical examination or just doesn't feel right, I always do a topography to just make sure that there's not something I missed. I also do it on every patients that have any sort of corneal irregularity. So think about not only your keratoconus patients, but any other corneal ectasias that you have within your office. All patients that have a history of refractive surgery or patients that are looking into refractive surgery absolutely need a topography. So RK patients, LASIK, uh, post-PRK, any patients with corneal surgical history. An example would be a corneal transplant. They absolutely need to, to have a topography from year to year. In some of the things you might not think of, patients that have pterygium. Randy talked about the elevation map. This is really critical for patients that have pterygium because you might say, well, I think that, you know, we'll fit a lens and this is what it's going to look like. But then you do the elevation map and you see, oh my gosh, they've got this pterygium is actually really in the way. And this may affect what type of lens we choose to fit them with. Any patients with corneal scarring, post cataract surgery. Sometimes I've had patients that they have these weird refractions after cataract surgery, and it has to do with where the incision was made for the cataract removal. So just random things that you just may not think about. And also patients that have dry eyes. So I have a 14 year old uh, Native American female. She came to the office for a comprehensive exam. And the chief complaint was the board is blurry at school, worse in my left eye. If you don't know anything about this case, classic patient that you see every single day. A kid, they're in school, they have blurry vision. Easy. Current spectacles, you can see here, she's got some myopia and some astigmatism. She's seen about 2030 in the right eye, 2040 in the left. So I go and do her manifest refraction. We see that her myopia has increased, which is normal for a child. Her astigmatism has increased as well, and kind of significantly on that left eye. A couple things that really pop out at me is, okay, her, her vision is achievable to 2020 in the right eye, but 2030 in the left eye, and she says it still has shadow. So that's a kind of a red flag for me whenever somebody says things look shadowy or double or ghosted. Another thing is that she's had a very large disparity, almost some anisometropia between the eyes. So the left eye is getting worse and worse, and it just seems interesting that they're not kind of progressing at the same rate and the cylinder has increased a lot within the past year. When I did her slit lamp exam, everything looked normal. She didn't have any thinning or stria or any other anomalies. Her dilated fundus exam was completely unremarkable. Pressures 12 and 13 completely within normal limits. But because she had that suspicious refraction and her decreased vision, let's get a topography to rule out the corneal issue. So we can see here her topography. This is a very classic keratoconus topography. This is something that when you took boards in uh, optometry school, this is like the classic case, right? You've got your hot spot. It's displaced a bit inferior central. K max is at about 50. So this is definitely not a normal eye. So she's got keratoconus in the left eye. I was using a placido disc imaging system. I referred her for a pentacam for both eyes so we can get a more detailed 
child image. And then because of her age, we wanted to refer her for corneal cross-linking as soon as possible. So some of the pearls that I take away from this case are she's a young child with Native American ethnicity. They are, are definitely more at risk for keratoconus. She's got increasing cylinder. Her best corrected vision was not corrected to, to 2020. She's got shadowy vision as a subjective complaint. Something else is even though I looked at the slit lamp, I didn't see anything. But like Randy was saying in the beginning, topographers are checking things at a micron level. So there is a huge chance and, and that this is going to detect signs of irregularity much faster than what you're going to be able to detect with the microscope. Really have to detect these kids early to treat them early. If this was caught years later, so she's 14 with a K max of 50. Let's say we didn't catch it until she was 20. She could have advanced significantly and maybe not even been a candidate for cross-linking and she could have been somebody that may have scarring or high drops or uh, need a transplant in the future. So super duper important if you've got that weird patient that you're like something just doesn't feel right something just seems off. I definitely recommend doing a topography to check and see what's going on.